أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله وحده والصلاة والسلام على من لا نبي بعده أما بعد إن شاء الله تعالى this evening we will continue in our series of lessons in the prophetic seerah the seerah of our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam. In our last class, who remembers the, is the Sahabi that we talked about his uh, story, his conversion story to Islam? Abu Dhar. Anybody remember his, his that's his kunya, anybody remember his name? Huh? Yeah, that's his tribe, Al Ghifari. He's from the tribe of Ghifar. What was his name? What was his father's name? Jundub Ibnu. Aywa Ibnu. Junada Al Ghifari. Abu Dhar Al Ghifari. So tonight, inshallah, uh, we're going to talk about his brother. Uh, the brother of Abu Dhar. Anybody remember the, br the brother that was discussed in the hadith? What was his name? Anis. Yeah, Unais. Right, Unais ibn Junada. This is the brother uh, from his father. That was his, that was his brother from his father. Uh, however, Abu Dhar radiallahu anhu has another brother from his mother. And his name is Amr ibn Abisa as sulami we talked about him briefly. We briefly mentioned Amr uh, maybe a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and I made an ishara to his, uh, to his story. <coughs> I was supposed to, we were supposed to read through it, uh, but we ran out of time. Uh, so inshallah, tonight we're going to talk about the brother of Abu Dhar. Uh, but they're brothers from the mother, Abu Dhar's mother. And the mother of Amr ibn Abisa as sulami uh, is the same woman. And so they're brothers through, uh, through the mother. And so Al-Imam Muslim, rahimahullah, <coughs> he brings uh, in his Sahih from uh, uh, it's hadith number 832. It's hadith number 832. Uh, so, Abu Umama al-Bahili, radiallahu anhu, he narrates uh, that Amr ibn Abisa al-Sulami said, radiallahu anhu. Um, <coughs> and the tribe of Sulami, I believe they are attributed to Sulaim. Uh, and I forget the name of the person that they are attributed to. Uh, but it's one of the tribes of the Arabs uh, because their lineage... Uh, what I do know is their lineage goes back to uh, the same lineage of the Arabs that came from Yemen. Uh, I don't remember exactly the, you know, the, the names of the individuals, inshallah. Uh, we can go back and check that, inshallah. But um, As-Sulami, they're from the tribe of Beni Sulaim. From the tribe of Beni Sulaim, which is a tribe of Arabs who come from Yemen. Originally, they're originally from Yemen. You remember we talked about how the, the Yemeni Arabs you know, left Yemen uh, and then they divided up uh, into different places. A lot of the people from Beni Sulaim, they ended up in Hims. Do you all know where Hims is at? Right, in, yes, right, in, in Syria. Uh, and so a lot of them, uh, and I, I believe Ahmed ibn Abbas is from them, who ended up uh, in, his la in the end of his life, he ended up dying in Hims, uh, radiallahu ta'ala anhu. So uh, Abu Umama al-Bahili radiallahu anhu, he said that Amr ibn Abasa al-Sulami radiallahu anhu said, during the Jahiliyyah, in the times of Jahiliyyah is referring to the days of ignorance, meaning before the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, because they were in a state of ignorance. They didn't know uh, about 
uh, Islam. They didn't know about uh, prophets and messengers. They didn't know about all of that. They didn't have all of the, the details. They had, uh, they had knowledge of Ibrahim and his son Ismail, but by the time, right, you know, right before the Prophet wasallam, the religion of Ibrahim had become so distorted that it was only reminiscences of the religion of, or the Dawah of Ismail. You know, there were, there were pieces here and there, the Dawah of Ismail. And so the people were ignorant. And so they call that time the time of Jahiliyyah, the time of ignorance. And so uh, Amr ibn Abbas al-Sulami, he said, radiallahu anhu, during the Jahiliyyah, I used to think that the people were misguided and not following anything real when they worshipped idols. Does that sound familiar? Who does that sound like? Huh. We talked about him last week. Abu Dhar. But what did he say? Huh? I thought he said he was on the religion of Ibrahim that was close to it. But he wasn't, he wasn't applying it. Right, that's what I'm saying. So Amr ibn Abbas, his brother, right? He's saying, during the time of Jahiliyyah, I used to believe that, uh, I used to think that the people were misguided and not following anything real when they worshipped idols. So that his brother, Abu Dhar, remember he said, I prayed, I used to make salat three years before I met the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Remember, he, he also had an, uh, an understanding that the people were misguided and when they were worshipping idols, he didn't like it. Uh, remember, he even insulted uh, Isaf and Na'ila when the two women were making tawaf around the Kaaba. And he said, you know, why don't you marry one to the other? You know, as an insult uh, to, uh, to their deities. And so now his brother, Ahmad ibn Abbasah, now has the same uh, type of understanding. He said, I used to think the people were misguided. I used to think the people were misguided. Even though at that time... You know, they, they, weren't, they didn't have knowledge because the religion of Ismail had been distorted by that time. So they didn't have a book to, for them to rely on and say, no, what, they, what they're doing is, is wrong. But the fitrah, the natural inclination of an individual that he was born on to worship only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it stayed within certain individuals. And you'll find that in some people that a person's fitrah is still salima. That even after he becomes an adult, he grows up in a land of kufr and shirk. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for some individuals, he preserves that natural state of wanting to worship Allah alone. And so this was the case for Abu Dhar, and it was also the case for his brother, Amr ibn Abbas al-Sulami, radiallahu anhu. So he said, I used to think that the people were misguided and not following anything real when they worshipped idols. I heard of a man in Mecca who was telling stories. So I sat on my mount and went to find him. And so now the, prophet, the news of the Prophet والسلام, had actually spread even early. Because remember, uh, we said that in a couple of classes ago, Amr ibn Abbasa thought he was number four. He thought he was the fourth Muslim. Even though Abu Dhar thought he was the fourth Muslim, and we're going to talk about that. Uh, why Amr thought he was the fourth Muslim, we're going to talk about that in just a second, inshallah. So early on in the da'wah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and we're still in the, we call it the marhala sirriya, the, the, the private da'wah. And, and so the da'wah even in private, as the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is giving da'wah in private, the news is spreading. Because what he's discussing and what he's teaching people is so revolutionary. It's so uh, against what the norm is that people are talking. And that's usually what happens when you start to bring something new uh, that is so different than what everybody is accustomed to, what everybody is used to. People are going to start to talk. It's going to be talked about over dinner. It's going to be talked about while people are hanging out with their friends. It's going to be talked about in all sorts of scenarios and situations. So he said, I sat on my mount and went to find him. Uh, he said, the messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, was in hiding and his people were persecuting him. So mind you, again, th 
This was still in the very beginning of the da'wah and, and the persecution of the kuffar of Quraysh started early on. They didn't wait until the da'wah, you know, years into it. La, it started early on. They started persecuting uh, the Muslims at the very, very beginning stages uh, of the da'wah of Al-Islam. So he said, the messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, was in hiding and his people were persecuting him. I kept a low profile until I managed to enter upon him in Mecca. I said to him, what are you? He said, what are you? He said, ma anta. He didn't say, man anta. He didn't say, who are you? And this is translated as, as who are you? But the wording in the hadith is, ma anta. What are you? And he asked, what are you specifically? Because he didn't want to, he didn't say, who are you? For him to say, my name is Muhammad ibn Abdullah, you know, from the tribe of Quraysh. That, that's not what he was asking him. What are you? What, what are you? What, what are you? What are you right? What are you claiming? Right? And uh, the Prophet وسلم, understood the question because his answer was, he said, I am a prophet. I'm a Nabi. I am a prophet. And so that was the answer of the Messenger وسلم, I am a prophet. And so uh, Amr ibn Abbasa said, what is a prophet? What is a Nabi? And you see very intelligent questions because he didn't know what a prophet was. Because the last prophet they had was who? Ismail, who had died you know, many generations before. So he didn't know what even a prophet was. This just goes to show you how much the religion had been lost to the point where they didn't even know what was a prophet. So Amr ibn Abbasa radiallahu anhu asked him, what's a prophet? Like, what is that? Very intelligent question. And so the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he explained, he said, I have been sent by Allah. Answering, I have been sent by Allah. Now, Amr ibn Abbasa asked another important question. He said, uh, with what has he sent you with? What did he send you with? You saying you're sent by Allah? Your prophet who's been sent by Allah, what did he send you with? Like, what are you calling to? What is your mission? Like I heard about you, people talking about you, but now I want to hear directly from you. I don't want to hear and learn about you from someone else. I want to hear it directly from you. What are you? What are you about? What are you calling to? So the Prophet ﷺ, he said, he has sent me to uphold the ties of kinship, to break the idols, and to proclaim that Allah is to be singled out in worship and that none is to be associated with him. And so now this is the foundation of the da'wah of al-Islam. And notice how the Prophet ﷺ, he started with Silat al-Arham, keeping the family ties. And so this was in the early stages of Al-Islam, very, very early stages of Al-Islam, the command to keep the family ties was revealed to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He was commanded to, to teach the people to keep the family ties, which shows us how important it is for us to keep uh, good relations uh, with, uh, with our relatives, with our relatives. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala He warns us In the Quran Against breaking family ties uh, For example Allah ta'ala he says فَهَلْ عَسَيْتُمْ إِن تَوَلَّيْتُمْ أَن تُفْسِدُوا فِي الْأَرْضِ وَتُقَطِّعُوا أَرْحَامَكُمْ أُولَٰئِكَ الَّذِينَ لَعَنَهُمُ اللَّهُ فَأَصَمَّهُمْ وَأَعْمَى أَبْصَارَهُمْ Allah ta'ala he says in Surah Muhammad Or perhaps Or and perhaps uh, if you were to turn away or perhaps you would turn away and you would create mischief uh, in the earth and you would sever the ties of kinship those are the ones that Allah has cursed them and he has caused them to be deaf and he has caused them to be blind and so Allah Ta'ala mentions here in this ayah about the people 
who cause mischief on the earth. And one of the ways that they cause mischief on the earth is by severing the ties of kinship. Allah Ta'ala said that He will curse them. The la'na of Allah Azza wa Jal are upon these individuals. And He makes them deaf and He makes them blind. Uh, very, very serious to show that the very serious nature of uh, cutting off the ties of kinship. Uh, a man in, in the Sahih of Al Imam Muslim, he reports that a man came to the Prophet وسلم, complaining. Because a lot of times we cut off our family members. Uh, a lot of times because of the problems that some of them, like we get, they, they give us headaches, right? They, they'll give us a headache. Uh, you know, we don't want to deal with them. So <coughs> we just cut them off completely. You know, like we call it, we disown them. We don't talk to them ever. Uh, and so um, in the Sahih of Al Imam Muslim, uh, a man came to the Prophet وسلم, and he said, O Messenger of Allah, I have family members who I keep the family ties with them, but they cut me off. I'm kind to them and I'm patient with them, but they are not kind with me and they're not patient with me. Uh, so the Prophet وسلم, he said, if it is as you have described, then Allah will remain your supporter as long as you are doing this. He said that Allah will remain your supporter, a zahir remain your supporter, uh, one that gives you strength uh, as, long as, you as long as you continue and you remain upon this. And so the, the Prophet والسلام, didn't tell him, you know what, since they're being mean to you, why don't you cut them off? Since they are disrespecting you, you don't have to talk to them anymore. You don't have to deal with them anymore. لا. The Messenger وسلم, encouraged him to continue in his actions, to continue in his actions. And so what that means is, it doesn't mean that a person always puts himself in a situation to be hurt and ridiculed. However, uh, a person, like for example, uh, if, he's in the, if he's in town, he doesn't go and come into town and leave town. And he has an uncle that lives in the town, except that he goes by and he visits. And he brings a gift. He says, uncle, I'm in town. Here's, here's a gift from me. Does that mean that he has to stay long? And, you know, and, and, and endure you know, the ridicule, endure the insults, endure the disrespect. La, it doesn't mean that. He comes over enough to say that he's come to visit his uncle and he's presented a gift or some type of, of, of kind deed in order to say, I'm keeping the family ties. If his uncle, for example, or his cousin is in need of money because you know, he lost his job and he can't pay the rent, and he needs surgery and all of that, he comes to his aid. He doesn't say, oh, well, you know, you've disrespected me, you're this, you're that. No, he comes to his aid and he assists him. Does he mean that he has to stay around and be insulted and ridiculed and disrespected? No, he can send the money through Zell, he can send the money in a check, he can go deliver it by hand, give salams, check on him, uh, see how he's doing, ask about his affairs, and then leave. This is still keeping the family ties. It's still keeping the family ties. And so what has been prohibited is cutting off people altogether. You don't travel, for example, to a place you have a brother or you have a sister in that, in that area and then you don't go and stop by and say hello, visit your nieces and your nephews. You don't do that. You don't, you don't, uh, you don't come in and leave. Because that's very, I, I would be offended if I had a relative who came into town and left town, and then I hear about it from someone else, that he went to visit friend who's not even a relative. You say, you know, what's going on? That would hurt, and it caused pain to your relative. And, and this is not uh, something that is permissible, even in the case where your relative is someone who may speak ill about you. For example, if your relative is non-Muslim, right, and you come over, you have a kufi on your head, you have a beard, and every time they see you, they say, ah, oh, Look at you, Look at, why don't you shave your beard, why don't you take that kufi off, right? Every time you see them, they say that. That's not a reason to not go and give them their rights. It's not a reason to go or not go and give them their rights. Uh, they have rights as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has obligated us uh, to give them rights and we have to fulfill those rights. 
Which is why when Amr ibn Abbasa, radiallahu anhu, when he asked, what did Allah send you with? The first thing the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, said, I've been sent to, to order the people to keep the ties uh, of kinship. And uh, I've been ordered by Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala, to call to that none should be worshipped besides Allah, azza wa jalla, and none, uh, there's no associates, and there's no, uh, 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 there's no associate, or none should be associated with Allah. And this is the call of every prophet and every messenger that has been sent by Allah. As Allah Azza wa Jalla says in the Quran, وَلَقَدْ بَعَثْنَا فِي كُلِّ أُمَّةِ الرَّسُولَ أَنِعْبُدُ اللَّهَ وَجْتَنِبُ الطَّاغُوتِ And indeed we have sent to every nation a messenger proclaiming worship Allah and stay away from the false deities. <coughs> and so this is the da'wah of Al-Islam. This is the da'wah of our messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, freeing the people from the worship of other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, and so, uh, Amr ibn Abbasah, he goes on, uh, he says, who do you have with you? Now he asks about his companions. These are all very, very intelligent questions. You can tell from the questions that Amr ibn Abbasah it was an intelligent man. And a lot of times you can tell the level of intelligence of an individual simply by sitting in his presence and listening to the questions that the person asks. And so Amr... Huh? <laughs> so, mind you, now he's getting ready to give his life over to this man. Because that's what the Sahaba did. You know, so before I give you my life, before I commit my life to you, I need to know who you are, what you're about. So that's why he was asking all these questions. And the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he gladly answered. He didn't say, hey, you're asking too many questions. Hey, you know, none of your business. <coughs> you know, who, you, who are you to be talking to me like that? Don't you know who I am? I'm, I've been sent. He just said, I, didn't I just tell you I was sent by Allah? What you doing asking me questions for? Now, he didn't say that. He just simply answered. He said, who is with you? He said, a free man and a slave. <coughs> a free man and a slave. Who do you think he was referring to when he said that? Abu Bakr, who was the free man and the slave? Huh. Zaid? No, he wasn't a slave at the time. Yeah, the Prophet ﷺ freed him. Remember we talked about that when Khadija, when she gave him to him, he freed him. So the, he wasn't a slave. When, when, when Zaid's family came to get him, because that's what they thought, he was a slave. <coughs> they came to get him. And, and the Prophet wasallam actually gave Zaid a choice. You can go with your family. Zaid said no. And then Zaid's brother ended up uh, accepting Islam as well. Uh, Zaid, but Zaid said, no, I'm not, I'm not leaving. I'm staying right here where I'm at. Um, but yeah, so no, he wasn't referring to Zaid. Bilal. Bilal ibn Rabah. Radiallahu uh, ta'ala anhu. Uh, so Amr said at that time he had Abu Bakr and Bilal with him among those who believed in him <coughs> so now this is why Amr ibn Abbas believed that he was number four he was the fourth Muslim the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Abu Bakr Bilal now him now mind you at that time there was uh, Abu Dhar, at this point Abu Dhar had accepted Islam, uh, Zayd ibn Haritha, Ali ibn Abi Talib, Khadija had accepted Islam, all of these people had already become Muslim. But it's possible that, as we mentioned before, the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam only mentioned Abu Bakr and Bilal because Abu Bakr had family. And if people knew that Abu Bakr was Muslim, it didn't matter because Abu Bakr could, 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 he could, he could protect himself. And Bilal was underneath of the protection of Abu Bakr. Bilal was underneath of the protection of Abu Bakr. And so the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, because he doesn't know at this point, Amr didn't announce his Islam. He didn't announce that I'm Muslim, that I'm going to follow you. And so the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, 
he answered him with information in a way that's going to still protect the weak ones from amongst them. Because if it got out that there are other people that were Muslim, <coughs> that information got out, then it's possible that there were some individuals that couldn't protect themselves. And Abu Bakr couldn't protect everyone. The Prophet wasallam, his family, you know, he had big family, uh, uh, Bani Hashim, but even he faced some persecution and he couldn't protect everyone. And so how did the Prophet wasallam, protect the weak ones from amongst his companions at that time? by just not mentioning them. He said, uh, he said a free man and a slave. A free man and a slave. And he didn't even mention them. <coughs> and he didn't mention them by name. So this is, the, this is uh, some of the ulama mentioned, this is why Amr ibn Abbasa, radiallahu anhu, he believed that he was number four. He thought he was the fourth person uh, to become uh, a Muslim. And so... Uh, Ahmed ibn Abbas said, he said, I want to follow you. I want to follow you. So now he's announced his Islam. Now I'm going to follow you and I'm going to obey you. Uh, and so the Prophet wasallam, he said, you cannot do that right now. Do you not see the situation and the situation of the people? Meaning it's, you know, the Prophet wasallam is... There's not, it's not a good situation for them. The people in power uh, are, are not allowing for them to call openly uh, or not allowing them to freely uh, practice their religion uh, because they're being persecuted. <coughs> Excuse me. And so the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he told him, you, 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 can't, you can't handle that right now. You can't do that. So he said, go back to your family. Because if he was to stay in Mecca, because he wasn't from Mecca, if he was going to stay in Mecca, then he wouldn't have anybody to protect him. He wouldn't have anyone to protect him. The family of the Messenger, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, protected him on the basis that he was from Beni Hashim. That's it. The Prophet, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, could not call Beni Hashim and say, "Listen, give this guy protection. Protect him like you protect me." He didn't have that type of uh, authority. He didn't have that type of uh, a level of, of authority in Mecca. And so uh, he was protected. He himself was protected to a certain degree because he was from Beni Hashim. Right? Just because he was from... They didn't necessarily even agree with... All of Beni Hashim didn't even really agree with what he was calling to. But because that's our nephew, that's our cousin, you know, you're not going to bother him. You're not going to harm him because that's family. And so, uh, because at this time, they still stood on a tribal system. You know, whatever you did, you did it. But you're not going to, if, if, his, if I come and I break your, your window, right, in your, in your house, I break your window, you better not come and try to, try to get me on your own. Don't bring you and your family and try to get me because you're going to have to deal with my family. You're going to say, yeah, but I was wrong. Yeah, don't, yeah, don't matter. It don't work like that. If he did you wrong, then you need to come through us. And we will deal with so-and-so. We'll deal with him in our way. But you don't have a right to come, just like, for example, <coughs> one of our children. If a child comes and, you know, Abdul Fatah, he comes and throws something at your head, right? You can't just go to the child and pick him up and, wop, 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 you know, give him a spank. You can't do that, right? Because the father is going to say, what you doing? You say, but he hit me. Father is not going to hear you. Yeah, you should have came to me first and let me deal with my child. And so this is the way the tribal situation worked. And so Ahmed ibn Abbasa, his family wasn't in Mecca. And so he had no one. If he would have stayed in Mecca, he would have had no one to protect him. And so the Prophet wasallam told him, go back to your family. Then when you hear that I have been granted victory, come to me. And this is from the Dala'il and Nubuwa. This is from the signs of prophecy. Because even at that time, at this time, the Prophet wasallam knew that he was going to have victory. He knew that he was going to be a parent. He knew this, at, even at this time, and we're still at the very beginning stages of the Da'wah of Al-Islam, and the Prophet wasallam he knew at that time that eventually he was going to be granted 
victory. So he sold him. <coughs> so he told him, when you hear that I have been granted victory, come to me. So he says, so I went to my family and the messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, arrived in al Medina while I was with my family. I started to ask people for the news after he arrived in al Medina. You know, I started asking people, hey, you know, what's going on? With so, with, he's, you know, the messenger of Allah, what's happening, what's going on? Um, he said, until there came to me a group of people from Yathrib, which is al Medina, which is al Medina. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was the one who actually changed uh, the name of Yathrib to al Medina. And I said, what did this man who came to al Medina do? They said, the people are hastening to follow him. And his people wanted to kill him, but they were not able to. So now that he heard that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is now, the people are hastening to him because Amr ibn Abbasa actually didn't arrive in Al-Madinah till late. He arrived in Al-Madinah till later on. And we want to see uh, from some of the questions that he asked. Um, and, and so uh, he missed Al-Badr, he missed Uhud, he missed uh, the, the, the Battle of Ahzab. He missed, um, he missed I, I even believe he missed Al-Khaybar. Uh, I think he came, right, if not at Khaybar, or a little bit after Khaybar. So he came in the later portions of Al-Ahd al-Madani. Because uh, the Prophet wasallam he told him, wait for me, you hear that I gave, I got victory. When you hear that I became victorious, then you come to me. And so he stayed with his family as the Prophet wasallam ordered him to do. And when he heard that now the Prophet wasallam was given tamkeen fil ard, he was given, uh, he was established, in the earth, it's at this time uh, that he went to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So he said, I arrived in al Medina and I entered upon him. I mean, I entered upon the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He said, O Messenger of Allah, do you recognize me? Now mind you, 13 years in Mecca, we're talking about maybe what, five, six years, seven years in al Medina. It's like 20 years ago that he met the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So he said, O Messenger of Allah, do you recognize me? He said, alayhi salatu wasalam, yes, you are the one who met me in Mecca. You know, the Prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam, had a very good memory. Uh, I don't know that if I met someone once in a different land, you know, we had a, a meeting or a lunch or something, we only had a meeting one time, and they go away, and 20 years later they come and say, hey, do you remember me? I don't know that... Uh, I don't know that I would remember. I have a hard time. I meet people one week on one Friday. They come back the next Friday and they say, hey, you remember me? Uh, yeah, I kind of remember you. Uh, what was your name again? I don't even really remember. Uh, <coughs> so the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had a very good memory. He remembered uh, people. And he said, I, he said, you are the one that met me in Mecca. He said, I said, yes. I said, O oh, Prophet of Allah, tell me what Allah has taught you that I do not know. Tell me about the salah. That's the first thing he asked. Teach me, like, obviously he knows that things have been revealed. There's knowledge that has been passed on. He said, <coughs> teach me from that which Allah has taught you that I don't know. Teach me about the salah. Teach me about the salah. And what he was asking was about uh, the times that it's not permissible to pray. Uh, and the reason why I say that is because you're going to see from the answer of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that this is what the Prophet understood, Alayhi Salatu Wasallam. So he said, pray the Fajr prayer, then refrain from praying until the sun has risen and become high. For when it rises, it rises between the horns of the shaitan and at that time, the disbelievers prostrate to it. <coughs> and so here, the Prophet wasallam is teaching us uh, that we're not allowed to make tashabbuh bil kufar, not allowed to imitate the disbelievers. Uh, and because the disbelievers who worship the sun, this is when the sun is rising, 
As the sun is rising, this is the time that they're prostrating uh, to the sun. And so the Prophet wasallam has prohibited us from making salat at that time so that we don't resemble and our worship doesn't resemble the worship of those who disbelieve in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it's not permissible to make tashabbuh bil kufar. It's not permissible to imitate the disbelievers, especially in uh, their worship. And then he said, Ali salatu wasalam, then pray, for the prayer is witnessed and attended. Uh, meaning that the angels, when you're making salat during the daytime, right, in the daytime between uh, after the sun rises to a certain uh, point and it's high, from that point you can start making salat again, meaning your voluntary prayers. And the Prophet ﷺ said that those prayers are witnessed, meaning by the malaika. <coughs> Uh, he said, then pray for the prayer is witnessed and attended until the shadow of a spear falls directly north. Uh, meaning at when the sun reaches its the zenith, when the sun reaches its highest point in the sky. He said, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, then refrain from praying. For at that time, hell is stoked up. Right? So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned yet again another time that is not permissible uh, for us to make voluntary prayers where when the sun reaches its highest point. He says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, then when the shadow moves forward, pray, for the prayer is witnessed and attended. Meaning, Salatul Dhuhr. Meaning, because when the, the shadow moves forward, that now that means that the sun has started its decline. Once the sun starts its decline, it's now time for uh, Salatul Dhuhr. And so now it's permissible to pray again. Uh, we're talking all of, I don't know what, 10 minutes, 15 minutes. How long does anybody know how long the sun sits there in the middle of the sky? Anybody know? I think it's like 10 minutes, 15 minutes. Uh, yeah, like 15 minutes or something like that. Uh, <clears throat> so when that, those 10, 15 minutes, that's when the Prophet wasallam has ordered us not to pray. So you want to know when those 10, 15 minutes are, look to see when Salat al-Dhuhr comes in. Those 10 to 15 minutes before that, that's when the sun is at its highest point because the time for dhuhr begins once the sun starts its decline. So we look and see, okay, the salat comes in at 12.12. 12. So now at 12, from 12.11 12, and 10, 15 minutes before that, then all of that is time we cannot pray because the sun is at its highest point. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, uh, for the prayer is witnessed and attended until you have prayed Asr. Then refrain from praying until the sun has set. For it sets between the horns of the shaitan and at that time the disbelievers prostrate to it. And so yet again at, the, at sunrise and at sunset, as the sun is rising and as the sun is setting, uh, it, it rises and sets between the horns of the shaitan and those who worship the sun, they are prostrating uh, to the sun at that time and so the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has prohibited us from prayer at that time so that our worship doesn't resemble the worship of the disbelievers. So Amr ibn Abbasa he said, O Messenger of Allah, tell me about wudu. Tell me about wudu. Look, I mentioned these intelligent, very intelligent questions. Ask, teach me from that which you know, I don't know. Tell, teach me about the salat. Teach me about the wudu. <clears throat> so the Prophet Sallallahu said there is no man among you who brings his wudu water, rinses out his mouth, sniffs water up into his nose and blows it out, but the sins of his face, mouth and nostrils drop out. So the sins drop off of the face, the nostrils and the, and the mouth, they drop out. Then when he washes his face as ordered by Allah, the sins of his face drop out with the water from the end of his beard. Then when he washes his arms up to the elbows, the sins of his hands drop out with the water from his fingertips. Then when he wipes his head, the sins of his head drops out with the water from the ends of his hair. Then when he washes his feet up to the ankles, the sins of his feet drop out with the water from the ends of his toes. Then if he stands and prays and praises and glorifies Allah as he deserves and his heart focuses on Allah, then he is cleansed of his sins and is as he was on the day his mother bore him. <clears throat> so Amr 
Ibn Abbas narrated this hadith to Abu Umama. Now remember, Abu Umama al-Bahili radiallahu anhu was also a companion. Uh, he narrated this hadith to Abu Umama, uh, and Abu Umama said to him, O oh, Amr ibn Abbas, watch what you are saying. Is such a great reward given to a, a man for one incident? I mean, look what you're saying. <clears throat> you know, watch what you're narrating. Be careful what you're saying. Meaning, you know, if you because if you make a mistake and you're lying on the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, it's a grave deal. Be careful because the Sahaba they really took it as a as a really big issue to to say the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said such and such. Because the Prophet said alayhi salatu wasallam, "Man kathaba alayya mutaammidan faliyatabawa maqadhu min al-nar." Whoever lies on me intentionally, then let him take a seat in the hellfire. And so it's a very big deal. So Abu Umama, because uh, it's as if he never heard this before. It's as if he never heard this before. So he tells Amr ibn Abbasah, you know, watch what you're narrating. Uh, so Amr ibn Abbasah said, O oh, Abu Umama, I have grown old, my bones have become weak, and my end is near. I have no need to tell lies about, Allah's message, about Allah and his messenger. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I'm, I'm at my death now. I'm old and I'm at my death. Like, why would I tell a lie now at this point when I'm about to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Why would I choose now to lie on Allah and to lie on his prophet? Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He said, if I had heard it only once from the messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, or even two times or three, until he mentioned seven times, I would never have narrated it. I mean, if I would have only heard this once, twice, three times, four times, five times, six times, seven times, then I probably wouldn't have, I, would have, I wouldn't have said anything. He said, but I heard it more often than that. I mean, the Prophet wasallam he narrated these rewards quite often. And Amr ibn Abbasa was present uh, more than seven times when the Prophet wasallam mentioned uh, these rewards. So this is the uh, the qissa or the uh, the story of the Islam of Amr ibn Abbasah al Sulami radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Uh, inshallah ta'ala, I will stop here. Uh, does anybody have uh, any questions about what we've covered? Huh? Because the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told him to wait till you hear that I've become victorious. So, you know, at Badr, he won a victory. But at Uhud, you know, they suffered a loss. They suffered a loss. So he didn't participate in no, he didn't participate in none of that. He wasn't, he wasn't there. He was with his family. Because the Prophet ﷺ told him to wait until you hear that I've become victorious. And so, it wasn't until he, when he asked and said, What's the situation? And he was told people are, are flocking to him. Right? People are flocking to him. It's at that point that Amr ibn Abbas had decided, okay, now I'm going to go to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Mind you, because when he first when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam first went to Medina, he wasn't uh, he didn't have you know he didn't have the numbers. People in the Arabian Peninsula still uh, looked at Quraysh as the powerhouse of the, uh, of the Arabian Peninsula. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had Medina, but Medina had the Aus and the Khazraj. Really, they, it was a very small place. It really had a lot of power. It wasn't, didn't have that position amongst the, the Arabs of the Arabian Peninsula. It wasn't until after Badr, after Uhud, after the, Ahz, the Battle of the Ahzab, when all of the different tribes came together and said, we're going to wipe them out once and for all. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala defeated, or had them defeated, had the kuffar defeated without much fighting. It wasn't even really much fighting, and we're going to talk about that, inshallah, when we get to it. But so, so, this, uh, so now the news of this, it spreads. The news of this, it spreads, and people become more emboldened with every victory of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam more people become emboldened by that victory because the dawah itself was convincing. The dawah itself was very, very convincing and people were leaning towards that dawah. Uh, it's just that, you know, they were afraid of the fight. They were afraid of the fight. I mean, I don't know if they're going to win, 
you know, the Kufar have 2,000, they only have X amount of numbers, ah, they might not win, but every time the Prophet ﷺ was victorious, even with his smaller numbers, it emboldened more people to come forward and say, you know what, we're, we're not afraid anymore to come forward and to, uh, and to accept Islam. To a point where now people were hastening to the Prophet ﷺ, and when that news reached to Amr ibn Abbasa about this, uh, that's when he said, I'm going to now go uh, to Al-Medina and meet up with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Now, so his first question was about the offense that he had already known, I guess, a little bit about. It's, yeah, because, so when we look at these stories, right, a lot of times uh, they're narrating, he's, at the time that he's narrating this, he was old. So obviously this happened years ago, years and years ago. And so uh, there's some things that are, that are left out uh, because you're telling a story. So, for example, um, if you, like, you went to Morocco, right? So if I ask you, tell me about your trip to Morocco. You're going to talk to me maybe 10 minutes. And in that 10 minutes, you're going to skip over. There's a lot of details that you're going to skip over. Maybe it's intentional. Maybe it's not intentional. Maybe you forgot. And so uh, <coughs> there are aspects of the story that most likely, uh, obviously, has been left out. Obviously, Ahmed ibn Abbasah, has most likely been following the news of the Prophet ﷺ along the way, talking to people, learning from people that he, you know, the tujjar, the, the business people that come through, that he's dealing with, he's asking, hey, you know, what about this situation? What have you heard? And they're talking. And so he's learning uh, this, you know, through uh, interacting and dealing with, with people. And I'm sure he's probably run into Muslims, people who had accepted Islam. I'm sure in his, in his dealings with individuals, he ran into those people and he learned things, which is why he asked about the timings of impermissibility to, uh, to make salah. Because he has some knowledge, uh, and Allah Ta'ala knows best. How far does it mean to relate to you? How far? Everyone, who has, everyone who's related to you by blood. by blood. Yes, anyone who's related to you by blood. Then they are your, then they are your relatives. So your second cousin, your third cousin, fourth cousin, all of them, they're your cousins. Now, obviously, uh, within your family, uh, your if you have a fifth or a sixth cousin, I don't even know if that's even possible. But if it was possible, it's obvious that he's a distant. That's a distant relative. Now he doesn't get the same rights that your brother gets. It's not even expected. It's not even expected within the family. It is expected for you to keep the ties of. Of kinship, but what does that mean when it comes to your father, and what does it mean when it comes to your fourth or fifth cousin? So, for example, uh, your father, there's a lot that's expected. So, if you, if your father is in, it lives in a town, and your cousin lives on another part of town, where, where do you, when you come into town, where are you going to stay? You're going to be staying with your father. Is your cousin who lives in the other part of town? Is he going to get offended? No. Why? Because he knows that your father comes first. But if the father wasn't in town and that was the only relative you had, where are you going to stay? You're going to stay with your cousin, right? And so uh, it's, a, it's, uh, it's known and it's understood, right? So, for example, if you had only had a few minutes, you stopped by your cousin's house and said, listen, man, I, I, I hear I brought you a gift. Uh, I can't stay long. You say, why can't you stay long? Oh, my mother has me. You know, she has me doing some chores. I have to take her to the store. He, he understands. You know, go, go, go be with your mother. They understand because he understands that the mother, the father, your grandfather, they have a different position as it relates to keeping family ties than someone who is a distant cousin. And so uh, keeping family ties, how that looks, it does depend on the culture of the people in which you come from. And so, and I tell people all the time, like my mother, my mother doesn't like when I like call her all the time. She doesn't like that. You know, if I call her too much, she, you know, she will be like, you know, what's wrong? Everything okay? Right? Who, did someone die? Like, no, I'm just calling mom. I'm, I'm calling to see how you doing. She's like, oh, you scared me. Like, I'm, you know, I'm busy, you know. You know, I just talked to you last week. You know, call me, I'll call you back. Right? And that's kind of you know, how my mother is, not because 
she doesn't love me. It's just because that's, you know, my mother is, is, is concentrating and she focuses on things that she's focusing on. She doesn't like to be distracted. You know, she likes to focus on what she's focusing on. And, you know, she doesn't want to talk on the phone. And I know there's lots of people, especially older people, they don't necessarily like uh, to talk on the phone. You can go visit, and they like to visit with you, sit and drink tea. But talking on the phone is not really something, uh, something that they like to do. Uh, and my mother is one of those types of people. She doesn't really like uh, talking on the phone uh, as such. Uh, I'm just mentioning that as, as an example, because someone else's mother... If you don't call her every three or four days, she's upset. And if that's the case, then what's required for you is to call her at least every three or four days. Because if that's what's expected, if she's expecting to, to hear from you every three days, every four days, then that's what's mandatory uh, to be put forward. And so, it's, you know, so what it looks like keeping the family ties is going to differ from family to family and from culture to culture. And so whatever it is that the culture dictates is supposed to be done, then that's what's wajib uh, upon us uh, to do. And Allah and Ta'ala knows best. Uh, last question, inshallah. Uh, Aina, yeah, I have a problem when I go visit the Uh-huh. Sorry. Uh, so... <laughs> so this, this is a problem I think every person is faced with that lives away from family. Um, even myself, my, me, myself and my wife, we're both from New Jersey, okay? Uh, and so, huh? Your wife is here. We're both from New Jersey. And so, uh, it's, it's, you know, when we go back to visit New Jersey, every, Every, everyone, everyone is saying, you know, everyone is excited to see us. They want to see the kids. And so, come over, come over, come over. We're cooking, we're cooking, we're cooking. Now, we're only, we only have three days, right? We only have three days. And so, it becomes like a job. It becomes like a job trying to go to see everyone. And so, we come up with a system where we set up camp in one place and we invite everyone to us, where, uh, or, or we maybe do that two or three times. Instead of trying to go see everyone individually, then we'll, 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 before we arrive, we've already set up three, you know, on this day, we're going to have a dinner at so-and-so's house. We invite certain people, everybody come over there. And then on the second day, we're going to go to so-and-so's house and invite everyone over there, and like this. And so that way we maximize our time, and we're not stressing out trying to see everyone individually, especially if you have a large family. Like how many you have brothers and sisters? Yeah, how many brothers and sisters you have? Any. So if, if you try to go to every one of them where they host you, like 10, if there's 10 of you guys, right? So you have to go to 10 different dinners. You know how, you know how long that takes you? Kala, you won't have enough time. So if you're only there for three days, it's impossible. You're not going to be able to... Right, so what you, what you could do is, you, for example, you have the elder, your brother, your oldest brother. How about my parents and her parents? No, then that means you have to have two separate days. No, we hold first. No, we have to have three days. Yeah, yeah, you have to, you have to have, you're going to have to, that, I believe that that's going to, because you can't, you can't go to Morocco, Sheikh, you can't, you can't go. The closest to the airport. I'm saying you can't. Because, like, how often do you, do you... She's going to stay at least two days or two and three days while I am in Morocco. I'm saying, how often do you get to go to Morocco? So that means that your wife can't, you and your wife cannot go to Morocco and not see your parents. So it has to be some type of system set up to where you spend some time with your wife's parents and some time with... Your parents, and and it, it comes. It's communication. You have to talk to them. Sheikh, I think he was asking. I think he was saying, who do he go see first? That's his problem. Yes. That's the question. Who do you go see first? Yes. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, 
Wallahi, Shaykh, I, I, uh, uh, I believe that you try to, you try, you, know, you and your wife come up with a decision, and then from that decision, you try to convince your parents of the, you know, of why the decision was made. Maybe you can switch, you know, so this, this year you're going to Morocco, you know, you go see your parents first, and then the next time you go to Morocco, you go see her parents first. Inshallah ta'ala, hopefully everyone will get, you know, get your parents a nice big gift, bring them, you know, uh, you know something from America, uh, you know, make them happy, especially your mother, you know, try to make her happy, because uh, they're excited, that's the issue, the issue is that they're excited, they haven't seen you in so long, and, and your mother is excited, she wants to see you. Uh, the, then they'll be your parents, they'll be your parents. Yes, but I, I don't. But I'm not saying that that's that's not always the best route uh, to take. Uh, you know, I think there should be discussion and agreements because these types of things can lead to heavy arguments. And if you make a mistake, let's say you go to Morocco, you make a mistake with your wife's parents, you come back to America, that you can't make that up. Like there's no way to, you can't say I'm sorry, you can't, it, it's, it's, it's done. And so the best thing to do is before you leave, part of the, the same way that you're preparing the plane tickets, how are we going to pay for the plane tickets, what's the date we're going to leave, the same way, you know, what are we going to pack, you have to have the discussion of how are we going to visit family. <laughs> that has to be, that has to be part of the, that has to be part of the planning. How are we going to visit the family? Allah al-Mustan, Allah al-Mustan. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. Yeah. Yeah, but that's, that's only going to be in certain cultures. Yeah, yeah, right, right. And, um, khair, inshallah. I'm going to make dua for you brothers, you know, going back to Morocco. <laughs> make dua for you all. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us and, and, and guide us to the best decisions. هذا والله تعالى أعلم وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد